let's get started. I mean, great way to start it, a little bit of uh, hopefully positivity because it's a very complicated topic. How do we prepare for the end of IDFA? And it's moderated by Joseph Kim. It'll be a frank discussion from an expert panel. He'll introduce them, I'll leave that over to him. But in the meantime, I just wanna set the stage a little bit for what you'll be listening to. So uh, it's interesting because we will have to think and rethink what we do. And if anyone's gonna be able to add some spice to this panel and some experience as well, I think my vote goes to Felipe de Rose. He has had experience reinventing himself. He's told me he has a career um, for, uh, uh, sorry, he's had a career reinventing himself. He's been in aerospace, so flying satellites, training astronauts, the whole deal. And we'll also get a press perspective from Alan Gulan. I hope I'm saying that right, Alan? Alan? Alan Gulan? Alan like Gulan, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Enough. Okay. We'll, we'll introduce you in a moment. But again, it was just exciting that you have had a lot of changes and you've also learned the secret for making the perfect espresso. So if, if that's another pearl of wisdom we will gain from this track. So I will hand it over to our moderator to take it from there. Cool, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we've got an exciting session today. Um, yeah, why don't, Filippo, why don't you just give a quick intro on who you are and, and what you do and uh, give us context on this conversation we're just about to have. Uh, hi everyone, um, thanks for, uh joining uh, and the invite to speak on this uh, panel. Um, so I'm Chief Growth Officer at Traplight, um, a little indie that has been around for a decade, but is uh, starting to emerge um, with their new title, uh, Battle Legion, that came out in July. Um, and we are gradually growing up to become a, a bigger and better um, uh, mid-core game. Uh, and I'm responsible for uh, a whole bunch of things, including UA admon, analytics, community support, and creative. Cool. Thank you for that intro. Uh, Andre, how about you? What's, what's your background? Sure. Hi. Uh, so yeah, I'm Andre. My background has been years and years. You know, I started as an indie game developer and grew through the phases into uh, a long time of live ops and game optimization. So I coming from a, a very deep data science perspective into IDFA um, and, and how to use that kind of data to make better game experiences. Um, now I'm working at Tilting Point, uh, which is a game publisher based in New York um, that you know has a progressive strategy of you know taking games and growing them and becoming larger partners with these developers um, and now we have at the, by this point seven plus years later then we have our own co-developed games so we we are a pretty large you know data driven data science now backed company trying to make better of ua thank you for that <clears throat> and lastly alon quick intro Thank you, Paul. Hi, everyone. My name is Alan. I work at Fiverr for many years and previously Interactive that was acquired by Fiverr. Uh, I'm VP product. Uh, we work a lot uh, closely with publishers. Um, as you know, Fiverr offers um, a, a suite of tools for publishers. Um, so our experience with what we're going to talk about is how do we help publishers get ready for iOS 14? Uh, but the publishers are also advertisers. We also boast, um, you know, a a programmatic exchange. So we work with publishers both sides on the monetization side and the user acquisition side. Great. All right. Thank you for that, everyone. Um, so quick intro from myself. So my name is Paul Bowen. Um, I am a chief revenue officer at Algolift by Vungle. Um, so Algolift is a predictive analytics company and marketing automation. Um, so we uh, predict LTV for mobile apps and automate user acquisition using that LTV. Uh, we were recently acquired by Vungle, uh, in part because of uh, uh, the, the solution or the approach we've taken to the deprecation of IDFA. Um, so uh, context for everyone, so context for this session. So Apple announced um, some pretty alarming uh, privacy changes back in June of this year, uh, effectively ending IDFA. Um, the changes that they proposed were supposed to go live in mid-September. Um, fortunately, I think for everyone, Apple delayed those. Um, 
However, Facebook had already said that they would they would stop supporting IDFA prior to prior to that deadline. Um, we're still to hear from a bunch of the industry leaders there around how they're going to to solve for this problem. But with that in mind, and the early early Q1 being the deadline that Apple said that they were now going to uh, push out those changes, it's a good time to talk about how we prepare for prepare for those uh, those coming. Um, so that's sort of the context. So. Um, just to get started, so what, what do each of us think that will be the biggest impact of ID, this effective IDFA deprecation? Um, who do you think is going to be uh, impacted the most? Uh, and I'll start with Alon. Sure, yeah. Well, first of all, I think Apple needed some extra time because there's, a, there's some uh, big impact on them as well. Um, but look, the impact is on, uh, on the advertisers, not so much on the brand advertisers. Them, I think they're kind of used to targeting and buying contextually, you know, reaching a, an audience. So it's the performance advertisers, the ones that are looking for, uh, um, you know, done the funnel events. Um, the biggest impact, uh, goodbye retargeting, goodbye uh, user level and welcome cohort and other uh, new models like LTV and incrementality. That I think is uh, the biggest change that's coming. Great, thank you. Andre, what, what do you think about that? Is that is that how you see it, or do you see it differently? Yeah, I mean, I I think I, I, I was going a little bit more specific. I think you know whale targeting is the part that really is getting basically wiped out, uh, at least on iOS. And you know, if anyone depended on that balance between ad monetization to ad whale targeting, if if the game was that kind of game then all of a sudden you have to start reconsidering how to make that game different. Um, so I think any game that had a very shallow level of depth that was counting on an ad per, per game core loop has to start thinking about how to add more in-app purchases or something because you won't be able to get such quality users into the games anymore. Isn't, isn't every game on, on mobile a whale-driven game though? Every IAP game? You know... I, I like to think that games can be fun, uh, not just for being well driven, uh, because there's so many users, right? Uh, it, it's a missed opportunity if you're only counting on one percent to to drive the revenue. Uh, but yeah, no doubt, uh, if 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 all your hopes were in the the hundred uh, users installs a day to drive the whole revenue, that you're you're in trouble. Cool. Thank you for that, Felipe. What do you think? Well, uh, first of all, I think um, it is alarming for us in the industry, um, but um, it's meant to be a positive change for uh, users who, um, you know, we're protecting their best interests in privacy, but I think ultimately they're going to end up just following on from what uh, Andre is saying. They should be ending up with a better content experience as well. Um, which might be a bit shaky at the beginning when it comes to like weird ad targeting because you can't recognize a user properly, but then eventually it should get better. But some games will probably become better and advertising will probably become better. And I say that in quotes because um, with a lot of uh, the dependency on would be accurate algorithms, uh, not exactly 100% accurate, but typically ac accurate algorithms. Um, the most important thing is to just find the right kind of quick, quick shot, efficient message to attract the attention of a payer or the, a, a, a you know a whale, a dolphin, or whatnot. So we're probably going to see a sort of an improvement in the way we um, present our narrative on advertising uh because we need to find if we can't target the whales then how do we speak to them right um so i think if anything it's just an opportunity for for all of us in the ecosystem to rethink a few things um and actually understand how deterministically were we in the first place when it came to attribution um so it's it's kind of a hard working moment because uh, we're all being thrown a wrench in some respects but it's also just kind of a very interesting moment an opportunity to re review a few approaches to how we do things do you feel do you think advertising or the creative is going to be more like 
TV advertising, more broadcast type, gen- generalized creative? It's a, it's, that's an interesting question, uh, Paul, which is why we voted for you as the amazing uh, <laughs> moderator. Um, I mean, it could be, right? I mean, of course, anything we say at this point, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, so it's funny to say there's a panel of experts on uh, IDF8. None of us are, <laughs> are an expert on this at this time. Um, uh, I mean, if that's the approach, then it means that the ecosystem has had a depression in pricing as well, because if we're able to afford that kind of broadcasting, then you know, CPIs have probably gone down. Uh, I think it's, I think it's more sort of related to really thinking about the narrative, the, what you're presenting in the ad rather than the usual, for the lack of a better term, clickbait. Um, but something that really speaks to a certain demographic or a certain audience. It's tough if you're at the beginning, right? Cause you don't really have, <laughs> a marketing persona to speak to because you don't know who your ideal users are. Um, but it will be more kind of um, uh, targeted through the pictures, targeted through the videos, targeted through the copy um, in that sense, rather than because broadcast TV tends to be a little bit catch all, right? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for that. So let's do a quick lightning round on some of the impacts of IDFA. Uh, so give me a very short 15 to 20 second answer for each question. So Andre, let's start with you. How much does ad revenue fall on iOS? 80%. You re- 80%? At least in the beginning. <laughs> wow, that's, uh, that's extreme. Filippo? Uh, 20 to 30. Along? A few months ago, we saw an, a one, 180% drop in eCPMs, and today we see anything between 30 to 50, depends on the placement type, like if it's rewarded in a visual banner. So I'm a little bit optimistic, not just because it's not 80, but because the, the trend is positive. Great. So anywhere between 80 and 20% drop. Um, so what happens to MMPs? None of you mentioned these in the who's going to be the biggest impacted. I don't know whether that was deliberate or tell me, tell me what you think about MMPs. Well, I think it's just a bumpy six to 12 months. Um, I think because like all of us experts in this, in this table, they're equally <laughs> experts in the new world. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of value in what they do if they figure out what to do. Uh, just like we all are experts in the future too, if we just figure out what we're gonna do. Fair enough. Al- Alon? I am looking forward to see uh, all these probabilistic models, um, you know, uh, how accurate they are. If they turn out to be as good as uh, some of the MMPs are pitching them, then, uh, then it's gonna be interesting. The interesting piece about a probabilistic model is there is no way to, to, to quantify whether it's correct or not. So that's, that's definitely going to be an interesting piece. Uh, Filippo? Yeah, I think, uh, Paul, I think you're right. Because uh, uh, the, the immediate answer is, uh, yeah, we're, you know, they'll probably pivot, right? Um, or at least some of their business units will pivot um, into what we shall see. Um, but... To, to your point, Paul, um, they're going to redefine the truth as we know it now, right? And we're all going to sort of accept it because that's the new norm and that's the truth of the new paradigm. And yet it's kind of a, you know, it, it's going to be hard to verify it. And yet it's going to be a tough pill to swallow for a lot of it probably. Um, yeah. so, well, we've been, do- we've been doing that for 10 years as well. I mean, actually. <laughs> attribution today we've all accepted how it's done and that's how it's done will uh will google follow apple with idfa uh, with the id deprecation so google ad id do you think they will make some changes there Filippo? no absolutely not <laughs> that's my, that's my wishful thinking no i think i mean obviously i'm not going to speak for google here but uh <laughs> um I think there's possibly some people at Google who know that there is an opportunity here to um, probably make a little bit of um, extra money here. You know, <laughs> uh, maybe that's a, that's a speculation. 
uh, does Google care about privacy? Of course they do. You know, that, that goes without saying. And it could be that Google will just be uh, pressured into changing as well, rather than them making a business decision. Who's going to apply that pressure? Oh, God. Um, am I still in 20 seconds here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Andre>. <laughs> probably, probably, uh, probably the mounting pressure of their own lawyers due to the endless list of uh, congressional conversations, court cases, et cetera, things like that. You know, there's sometimes you just, you fall under that pressure. Thank you for that. Andre, what do you think? Yeah, I think that they're going to save the IDFA like tracking as like a bone to give out when if something gets really bad for them legally, which yep. does means probably not in the next 12 months, but probably in two years, they will have to take that card out and be like, fine, we'll give you partial tracking uh, privacy features. Um, I think it'll be very, very hard for them to remove all tracking the way Apple did, just because of the way the ecosystem works. Um, yep. th there's just too many hurdles to do that, but they'll try something. Hold on, anything to add there? Yeah, look, the, the short answer is that we don't know. Um, I can tell you that as Fiber, we operate based on the premise that it's happening any moment. And so whatever we build for iOS that can be relevant to Android, for example, a contextual parameter suite, we deploy it on Android as well. Um, and we're studying their refer APIs and whatever, whatever can help us uh, prepare in advance because it, it's happening. If it's in two years, great. If it's in two months, we want to be ready. Cool. All right. So we have four, uh, three minutes left. So I want to talk about the number one priority for game studios preparing for a post IDFA world. What would your recommendation be? Uh, Alon, let's start with you. Uh, for game studios, uh... Look, one thing that's not going to change uh, when you're doing user acquisition is um, that some sources will still perform better than others. And so what we're trying to do with, with game studios that are, you know, we're work with, we, we operate in exchange, but we try to work directly with the marketeers to try and help them find the insights to discover those better sources faster. And so um, my recommendation is um, besides you know looking at the studying the new models out there and trying different partners is to also get closer to the supply sources as much as possible at least those that give you the access and try to see how you can get to a, pos a position where you find the good sources fast thank you andre yeah i mean to to echo alan uh it's i think that you have to be looking aggressively at every new provider and service out there um, because it's actually kind of nice to have competition now uh, for who's going to take over attribution. Um, and going towards that end, I think that the, as you said, being closer to the source is always better. Um, so you don't, you can't just trust, you know, some, some aggregator anymore, which is good. I think it's good for everyone to be aware of this. Felipe, what do you think? Um, well, I'm, I should give a similar answer in terms of just talking about growth, uh, but I'm a big product uh, believer. I love product. Um, um, as we can tell from all our answers, we don't really have a uh, clear, you know, I mean, we have some ideas, but it's difficult to predict the future. So my, my, my message to gaming studios would be focus on, on, on the content. Um, just to basically expand on what Andre was saying before, like it's, you're going to have to look at if your game is too whale focused, then what are the ways to make monies from the dolphins and the, the minnows as well? Um, so just make a great game that can make money across all spectrums, across the entire curve um, without any unbalance, all in favor of whales or all in favor of, of minnows. And then everything else becomes much easier. <laughs> you know, you can tinker and experiment as much as you want with creative and do all sorts of crazy stuff and try to figure out what's the best way to track and so on and so forth, you know. Um, probably not the ideal answer, but that, that that's what I would do. Focus on high quality content. 
So my one recommendation, I'll, I'll give one here, is is to implement the SK Ad Network framework. So um, in the next sort of two to three months, I'd really recommend all game sh studios work either with their MMP or directly with Apple to uh, in implement that. Um, because if you don't, you're not going to be able to track uh, attribute at all on iOS. Uh, cool. Um, so how, how do we think UA budgeting changes on on um, on iOS 14? Do, do we adjust budgets off, say, a D1, D3, D7 ROAS, off a short-term ROAS, or do you think do you think it may move to something else? Felipe, what do you think? Yeah, well, uh, let's again looking into the crystal ball. Um, I think it's quite obvious that it's going to need as many early signals as possible. Just uh, going from the current guidance of the documentation from Apple, it's, I mean, it's still a little bit fuzzy how many, like, you know, if we're optimizing by uh, day seven, day 14 signals for like a super hardcore game, uh, that might be a bit of a struggle, hence the, the cannot hunt whales anymore. Um, so, <laughs> that's that's going to be one of the the hardest things that it's you probably need to find different um early signals to say you know this is good ROAS uh or this is good engagement this is good retention whatever you can hold on to to optimize basically in the uh, as early as possible uh, but the documentation might change in the coming months <laughs> what do you think what do you think uh Alon? about budgeting, how are, you, how are we gonna term, so we have this, this value called conversion value from Apple that gives us some insight to post uh performance. Um, are we gonna use that to determine how to allocate budgets or something else, what do you think? I've heard everything by now. Um, the one thing that, I've, uh, that, I, that we noticed is that there is a lot of um, category targeting or you know, some sort of con contextual targeting that we actually see from uh, hyper casual publishers quite a bit. Um, so I wonder if, um, if they're just going to continue as usual and if others will follow suit in terms of how they, uh, how they both target and how they measure. Um, but regarding like which, uh, which model uh, and if you're just going to use SK network, as Felipe said, I mean, uh, we'll see what bones uh, Apple throws us in the next few months. But right now, I think everybody is trying everything. Andre? Yeah, I mean, SK Ad Network is, is still, in my, in my opinion, highly undocumented, uh, in especially the conversion value department. Um, like, we might as well be trying to send noise over and see what happens, because we don't know. Maybe nothing happens. Maybe, like, the wire is not connected at Apple side yet. Uh, so I don't know. And it makes it hard also to test multiple ways of doing it. Uh, multiple ways of calculating these values because you can't A/B test. You can't compare, you know, adjusts versus, you know, I don't know, Fire's conversion value algorithm um, or your own events. Um, so it's, it makes it for a very large problem to solve. Um, I think that the the interesting thing that I think it's nice to have is that yes, D one, D seven are important, and I think they'll remain being important. But if you think about Apple's like idea and what they're pushing is like, yeah, we should, if you make a better game with a bigger, you know, funnel of actually engaging work that not just whales want to engage with, then we should still be striving for something longer than D7, because that's where that, that a lot of problems get solved if you could get to that point. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, so, deeping, diving a little bit, bit deeper on attribution, uh, can you talk about how growth teams are going to address attribution on iOS, uh, iOS post post deprecation? Um, yeah, ha, yeah. I mean, you, you know, Andre and Filippo, especially, you've been work, probably working with the MMP, to your MMPs to understand what that's going to look like, or building your own solutions. I'm curious, you know, what you think, what you think that's going to look like post. Post iOS 14. Felipe, do you want to guess? 
Oh, okay. I was just, I was just waiting for a long to go. Um, yeah, I mean, the 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 model is like uh, Alon was saying. You know, these probabilistic models, uh, and there is a lot of talk of um, incrementality, and uh, it's it's becoming the the new buzzword, like fraud, like big data, and all this. Um, uh, it's actually extremely hard to see this now. Um, we really need to see real numbers to understand what's what's going on. Even an incrementality model might be wrong at this point. Um, but we we yeah we we need to see it in action, and it will be a few months. Uh, but what we're thinking about is some form of incrementality, certainly. Um, and then, as far as retargeting is concerned, I mean the focus of that will only be internal. So not paid retargeting uh, for now, but just, you know, all the various channels you have internally from social media to uh, push messaging to in-game messaging and so on, because you have your own ecosystem with your own ID. Um, Andre, you're a data scientist. So I'm expecting a really smart answer on probabilistic, a probabilistic model you know, a, a media mix model, which I think is also a probabilistic model. What, exactly. what do you think? How do you think? Um, how do you think attribution looks like on iOS fourteen? I mean, I like to. I, I like the opportunity that IDFA is giving to data scientists to to aim higher, right, and and to try some stuff like, you know, you know, hit for the fence and and see where it lands. So things like top down attribution, for instance, sounds really interesting, which is a different way of saying media mix, right, in some ways. Um, probabilistic sounds interesting as well, if it could be done uh, truly probabilistically. Um, the Because there's ways to cheat. That's the unfortunate thing. And we'll never really know for sure. Um, so I think all of them are, are valid. Um, and I think they all have a chance. And I, you know, as Philippa was mentioning, you know, retargeting is probably going to come down back to being like something you do just like with push notifications and emails and stuff like that there's a little bit of me thinking that like now that people are making better games because they have to improve not just the whale side but minnows and, and dolphins as well is there's a whole world of you know cross app promotion you know ecosystem that went away with game center right uh, and, and maybe there is something there to bring back the whole feeling of, hey, you know, I play this game and I see this other game because we share the same SDK internally that, and we get cross promotion again back from within the app. So I think there's some really cool stuff. Uh, the data science part is obviously the most exciting, but I think that there is a, there is a definitely a room for like cool game mechanics to come back that have gone away for a couple of years now. Great, thank you. Alon, anything to add on how growth teams address attribution? I just wanted to say we love data scientists. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of the things that we, we, we attempted to do, and I think it will help people like Andre, is um, did whatever we can that is privacy, privacy friendly, right? So we brought, a, we brought along a lot of contextual parameters. I mean, you can call them contextual or just privacy friendly parameters that can be used. Um, you know, like session depth, what was the last ad the user saw, things that definitely fall in line with Apple's guidance. It's not like the IDFA, but it's certainly bringing you hopefully closer, closer to be able to, um, you know, maintain a, a level of intelligence and that people like Andre can actually, you know, keep, keep the growth teams uh, good at their job. Cool. Thank you. So Andre, you touched a little bit on cross promotion as, a, as an exciting opportunity. Um, I think, you know, ge generally that's, especially between studios, cross promotion is, is pretty much dead right now. Uh, within yes. studios, I think it's, it's, still, it's still important, but not, not relative to, to new user acquisition. So there's been some debate on IDFV. Um, how do you think that's gonna factor into, into growth for marketing teams? Is that gonna be something we're talking about or is it just a, just a talking point right now. I think it's a talking point because technically I, I, I have difficulty understanding the value of IDFV 
for anything large scale, right? Because it's an ID based on the device, based on the fact that from a publisher is connected to it. So we can I can't share my 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 IDFBs with Filippo unless we both publish under the same title, under the same label. So I think it's going to be very hard. You might as well use IP addresses at that point. That's my feeling, at least. Hello. First of all, IDFB is not new. I know you guys know, but everybody, you know, everybody talks about IDFB if it, if, as if it wasn't released the same day that IDFA was released. So this is not new. And in fact, uh, many platforms out there were collecting it because we need to be able to reward users um, and, you know, uh, just count daily active users and different things that IDFB was used for. Um, is it going to help you track users across apps? No. Will it help you track your own whales? Perhaps. If you, if you, there's a lot of consolidation out there, um, that can help you, right? If you're a very big company with a lot of studios and a lot of games, then you can suddenly have your own Cisco ecosystem for advertisers. Far-fetched, but that is something that we expect to, to see, right? Because as Andre said, if a lot of, uh, a lot of studios are under the same label, the IDFV is, is kind of like an IDFA for them. Um, and last but not least, I mean, look, it's a, people use it for frequency capping. So th there, is there is value in it. We, we need it right now. Um, with, a sh with a studio with one game, Filippo, what do you think about IDFV? <laughs> well, that, I think you've answered the question already by saying <laughs> one game, who cares? Uh, it's definitely, hopefully, more valuable for a tilting point than it is for, for us. Um, um, it, it, it is, as Alon said, it's become another hot topic, like uh, like incrementality, probabilistic modeling. Um, and and uh, I think it's important for everyone to remember that if it's trackable and not approved by Apple, then it's a no-go. Now, whether Apple will start policing this uh, you know, by banning you and whatever, that's another story. Um, so you also have to make a very specific business decision to, to pick a, a, a hack, if you will, which is not a hack. IDFE is not a hack, but um, Apple has made it quite clear in their guidelines. If it's something trackable, then it's got to come out of SCAD network and that's it. Um, so, so yeah, it's not, you know, it's just another big talking point in and, and it's healthy to have that discussion, but let's be real as well. Cool. So I'm just going to move on to some of the Q&A uh, just to go off, off topic a little bit. So um, one of the, a couple of people within the uh, have asked questions around uh, hypercasual. So obviously there's been a meteoric rise in hypercasual over the last three, two or three years, I guess. Um, the business model is, 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 is fully reliant on, on ad monetization uh, with razor thin, thin margins. I'm curious, um, Andre, what do you think about how casual is a, a genre? Do you think it's sustainable given this 80% drop that we're going to see? My assumption is not, but um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. You know, I, I hope it's sustainable because it's some of the best games are. <laughs> are these hyper casual games because the mechanics do make sense uh it's just that like they the development cycle is like okay guys you have one week to make the game and publish it uh and not you know eight months ten months to to, to really polish it so i hope that it is sustainable um but but given you said there's going to be an 80 percent drop in yeah revenue. i know i know i know <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm buying myself time to answer the question uh, <laughs> Uh, I think it comes down to you. You have to add other mechanisms on top of it, right? You need the 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 meta meta game to be added to these games. And I think if you can add those, maybe it's something that's replicatable across all games that you have, like Voodoo. I don't know. Uh, if you could add that little component to all your games and have the the basic examples, like this is back five eight years ago, right? Uh, gold upgrade for the game get the super special cannon that's made of gold for 9.99 and share it with your friends um I, maybe that's how they'll remain sustainable so the, so these are no longer hyper casual as games as they're known today though right Be, you know I hope they that, mature. the hybrid hybrid casual or, or casual whatever you want to call them mm -hmm. Felipe, what, mm -hmm. what do you think yeah i think that that's it that the what we said before as well that if the game that this time in history is encouraging us to make better games right so 
I think we're already seeing in the hyper casual world this kind of slow upgrade towards the mm -hmm. what is commonly defined as hybrid casual or something along those lines. Uh, like if you look at Game Jam, for example, or, or companies like that, they're, they're more puzzlers than, than just hyper casual brain dead stuff. So, uh, but they're great mechanics still. <laughs> um, but you know, the, the so I, I, that is more likely to happen because they 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 need to cover a wider spectrum uh, that is of of the monetization curve, which is not covered by the ads, but will be covered by the product through the in-app purchases. Cool, Alon, any anything to add there? We hear a lot of people asking us if uh, hyper casual is dead um, from at least from a user acquisition perspective, right? If they can continue uh, grow every new game, we don't think it's dead. Based on what we see, a lot of hyper casual advertisers are actually, yeah, they use the IDFA, et cetera, for, for different kind of measurements, but they target quite a bit based on categories. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear when you actually see the analysis on how the buying is being done from some of the names you, you mentioned. Um, and again, we're, we're at least trying to help with, uh, with other things like session depth, you know, try to figure out if they can bid on uh, and buy the, the first impressions of every, uh, every app, um, sorry, every app session. Um, we don't think it's dead. We, we actually think that some of the practices they've been using in the last few, uh, few years uh, can actually stay. And so I'm, I'm optimistic about, about this genre. Uh, so another question from the Q&A, are you as optimistic about ad fraud being dead on iOS 14? Is that is it done now? Apple's Apple's doing the attribution or, or are we going to see it rear its head under some other form? I, I, I will take a stab at it. You know, not all ads are app install ads, first of all. And so there's a lot of uh, some of the, the most uh, app fraud you'll see um, especially for the, you know, the simple banners, um, it's just there to, uh, to, you know, take on impressions that load somewhere behind the scenes, et cetera. So that unfortunately is not dead. And I also don't see how this is being addressed by the deprecation of IDFA and the introduction of SCAD network. Um, so that, that is definitely staying with us, unfortunately. Regarding the rest, I'll, I'll actually uh, defer to Filippo and Andre. Filippo and Andre. Filippo, is fraud dead? On iOS 14? No. Fraud will never die in a business where there's a lot of money. Period. But I'll find it. it's, as always, it's uh, way overestimated as a problem. You agree, Andre? Well, now, I was going to start from the end of Filippo's answer backwards. I was going to say, you know, you know, if you focus on like the ad networks that, uh, that are that perform the best, like AdMob and Facebook, there is almost no incentive to for ad fraud to, to ad fraud to exist in the first place. And from the whale hunting targeting, you know, kind of system, like so. To me, I don't really see ad fraud as being a big problem today. Uh, but yes, if you're talking about like the little crappy banner ad that you put on the bottom of a clicker game where I click on it three times every session. Yeah, absolutely. And it's still going to remain a, being a problem. Cool. Um, so a, a math question from the audience. If average CPMs drop, both UA and administration, average CPMs drop. So the average ROI and ROAS will remain the same, isn't it? Why worry? Andre, what do you think about that? If, if the whole, if, if everything just, everything cuts by 80%, surely, Surely we're, are we in the same position? C CPIs are 80% down. Uh, Abmon is 80% down. Are we good? You know, I'm a data scientist, not an economist. Um, <laughs> the, the question, I don't think it will be the same. It will not be even. Um, and I mean that the drop will not be even because the, the targeting still to some extent exists just in a broader sense. Um, so your ad revenue will drop, but you still can target the United States. Uh, you can still target, you know, some, some players and some users who are more expensive to target. So it will not be even, and, and you'll have to make a, some calculations on how to, to make that work. But that's just me. And then the follow-up question that I actually think a lot more is how will the develop next year? 
because yes, there is going to be some crazy shifts, but I don't think it's a shift that will stay forever. Uh, it will, they, the ecosystem will evolve. Um, the question is which direction, which both of those numbers go up or down. I don't know. Sure. Should you throw anything to add there in terms of the economics and on the buy and sell side? No, I think uh, Andre gave a really complete answer. Uh, the, the, I think the, the point is that um, since we're all in the same boat, isn't it just going to work out anyway? Um, and uh, the answer is no, because we're not all on the same boat, because we all have different products. But especially people are forgetting that we're on this boat with uh, brands. And so the, there is actually potentially an opportunity for, you know, the bigger names out there to, to even find more competitive pricing for themselves and price us all out nicely. <laughs> um, so um, it remains to be seen, but I'm, I'm not hanging on for this sudden, oh, my CPI has gone from five to one dollar overnight. No. Alon, any thoughts to add that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I like the optimistic question. You know, it sounds like everything is just going to work out. So I, I like the optimistic nature of that question. Um, look, I think what's going to happen and why, why we will see some negative effect initially is because people will wait to see what happens. Meaning what will be impacted is the appetite and uh, the willingness to take risk, right? To explore new inventory when you don't know much about it. And so even if everything will, you know, will reach a new point of equilibrium, as the question suggests, um, I'm just saying it might take a little bit of time, right? There's ECPMs might not be impacted, allegedly, you know, like everything will balance, but fill rates might be impacted, meaning the appetite to try and buy this inventory. Um, so if you ask me, there will be some short term impact, but at the end, we will reach a new, a new equilibrium point, right? We will, we will figure it out. Cool. Um, great. So I'm, I'm curious, everyone seems, well, a little concerned for the future, but also excited uh, to see what it see what it looks like. I, I feel like this, this industry is sort of 10 years old now and had got a little bit stale and, and this has really sh shaken things up. I'm curious what, what everyone thinks is the biggest opportunity that emerges with IDFA deprecation. Uh, Filippo, do you want to go first? What, who, who, what do you think the biggest opportunity is? Who's going to capitalize on it? Uh, well, let's hope, uh, just echoing what I said before, uh, uh, creative marketing will really go, go wild uh, in a nice way um, because there is a little bit of staleness in the advertising. Um, and also, you know, products will really become that much better and attract that many more gamers. Uh, maybe offer some really premium AAA kind of experiences, even though we have some sort of definition of AAA in the market now, but it's not, it's not at the level that you would see on, on console. Or, uh, of course, the console experience is very different from a handheld device, but still, uh, there could be some real new economies emerging that are very interesting. So that there is a there is a there is an opportunity there if we can capitalize on it. Andre, what do you think on from yeah from game dev yeah. side from from the marketing side, whichever side you want to take it? Yeah, I think that the the idea say if I if the way I see it is you know the it has basically uh, taken out the the M and Ps from being the center equation that also created the ad advertisers to be in this central part of the equation for a product. And, and I would go like that to be a little cliche, but you know, it kind of democratizes the whole mobile ecosystem. Finally, everyone has an equal amount of data, an equal amount of opportunity and insight and, and, and gut feeling and, and a lot of things and a good game is what's going to make a difference. Um, so in, in a way, I think everyone is actually winning uh, at a fairer level, right? Everyone Now everyone from the small developer to the large EA developer has equal abilities to, to make a good game and also to advertise it and reach a, the same audience. So I think that, that this is actually really good for the whole thing, for the whole ecosystem. 
Alon, anything I, to add I, there? I really agree with Andre. When there's mess, there's an opportunity, right? Uh, I think there's a level playing field now. Um, I'm excited about new entrants. I'm excited about smaller publishers um, trying new things, trying to do things on their own, perhaps. I mean, the you know, it takes away the pitch of a secret sauce slash AI slash ML. Um, those will be there, Andre. <laughs> But but yeah, I, I'm excited about uh, about the fact that now everybody's on the same playing playing field at least for a while. Cool. Um, so, lightning round number two: who are going to be the biggest winners and losers? Um, so, thirty seconds for your responses, Max. If you just want to name one company, then great. If you want to name a, a segment of companies, that's good as well. Alon, biggest winner. Um. Creative studios. I mean, those that create uh, beautiful playables. Um, yeah. Interesting. What can you explain a bit more? I just think, yeah, you gave me twenty seconds. I just think that those, uh, <laughs> there's um, the the creative is going to be uh, much more important, as, as all of you said previously. And I think that uh, the industry will start to explore and either build new creative studios or work with the existing ones. There, are, there are a few out there that are really, really good. I think they're going to see. They're already seeing more people turn and ask them for help. Thank you. Andre, who do you think is going to be the biggest winner? I think it's the whole new ecosystem of companies uh, providing to UA, com UA marketing. So I'll go lift style things. Uh, anyone that has a top-down approach, any of these I think have a, are big winners now. Cool. Felipe? Well, I'm going to say something that might surprise as many people, but uh, I'm going to say Apple. Um, Explain more. 30 seconds. Yeah, no, it, it's very simple. Not for the obvious reasons, um, like, you know, owning the ecosystem and so on. But actually, what we noticed um, is that there has been an increase in communication from Apple and dialogue with different developers and different other actors in the ecosystem. Um, they came out with this announcement. They realized that it got some some feedback. Let's not say whether positive or negative feedback. And they started talking a bit more and listening, and sort of taking a step back and going, "Okay, we'll we'll think we'll think this through." Uh, hopefully, that will lead to a more organized industry where there is proper there is a proper table where we can discuss with mm -hmm. Apple different things rather than just have this sort of unbalanced relationship uh, where where we can't say. You know, we can't have these conversations with Apple all together as a, as a group. Cool. Um, you all went for that one. Yes, yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, Andre, did you go? Sorry, you did go, yeah. Um, okay. So we did biggest winner, biggest loser, be as non-political or political as you'd like to be here. Uh, Alon, do you want to go first? Who's the biggest sure. loser? Uh, I'll just say I'm worried about the companies that are trying to circumvent uh, Apple's new policy. Um, I Nothing there is long lived. If you ask me, I think Apple are serious. They might throw us a bone here and there, improve SCAD network, but if you're trying to track, uh, you will be blocked at some point, one way or another. Filippo, what do you think about that? The biggest loser, is it? Um... Uh, it's a tough one to respond uh, in a politically correct fashion. I'm, I'm going to echo a little bit Alon here and say whoever is making the most noise about this is definitely going to be the biggest loser. Um, and trying to murky the waters with uh, a lot of noise around uh, incrementality or probabilistic or special kinds of targeting and trackability. Anyone just... Um, doing a lot of content marketing around their wishful thinking is not focusing on the right things right now. Andre, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I was going to be way more specific, so I'll, I'll, I'll broaden it to Filippo. Uh, <laughs> I think retargeting as an industry will have to pivot, right? So to something else. I don't know what that is. I don't know what they're saying. Uh, but uh, remerge addictive, like all these like high, very specialized targeting companies or retargeting need to, we'll have to come up with something different. Um, but that's just a, that's just like a small part of the whole ecosystem. So it's, they're quite small losers in the end. It's not, you know, 
a whole a whole side of the industry going away. Cool, great. All right, well, I think we're at time now. So um, thank you, everyone, for your for your contributions. Very insightful. Um, and yeah, I think looking forward to seeing what iOS, well, the privacy changes bring for all of us uh, early next year when Apple Apple finally pushes them out. Uh, Great job, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.